Hello, and welcome back to The Pseudo Show. My name is Bill, and joining me for today's episode are Neil and Brandon. Hi. Hello. Neil is actually about five feet away from me, and Brandon is more than five feet away from me. We'll just leave it at that. (laughs) Someday, someday Brandon will be five feet away from us. I don't know when, I don't know how. But it is a mission of Brand- of Bill and I to make it so that all three of us are somewhere somehow so we can actually do something together. And trust me, everybody out there, you'll know. You will know. We will tell you and we will do every, we will make every attempt to live stream said event. As long as you don't put me in another free BSD gel. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're good with pleasant. that. It was uncomfortable for us too. Speak like the for yourselves, I thoroughly enjoyed that experience. And I'm already plotting the next jail we put him in, whether that's BOS, Haiku OS, OS2 Warp. Oh, God, please, no. I don't AIX, want to do that. AIX, anybody? HPUX? Okay, well, I don't want to make my coworkers sick here today. Uh, AIX would be okay. <laughs> AIX would be Just okay. no. But now, if it was Solaris, a- let's have some fun here with the zones. Oh boy, we could we could dive down the rabbit hole of esoteric operating systems all day if we so chose. But on today's episode of the Pseudo Show, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network, we are going to step away from our proverbial desks and go hang out around the water cooler, where all the best conversations in the office happen. The water cooler episodes will cover a mishmash of topics that we find interesting out there in the open source community. And don't be surprised if things jump from topic to topic. That is the purpose of this, just like conversations around the water cooler do when you are at your said office. If you don't have a water cooler and you have a coffee machine or other some sort of liquid dispensing device in your office, I highly suggest you think about that device while you are while we are having this conversation. As long as it's not a Coca-Cola freestyle machine or Pepsi equivalent, not those. In my case, it would probably be a uh, fountain that just provides free champagne to everybody in the office. What office do you work in? The one in my head. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, or for me, it's coffee, always espresso. I, I'm a, the king of the hobby. Like uh, becoming a king of the hobby, of do it of uh, the coffee hobby. I have too much coffee equipment now at my house. So <laughs> I have somehow managed to avoid this curse of coffee machines, and for the most part, I think in I guess my equivalent of a water cooler is usually a juice dispensary. I have a bunch of mixed fruit juices and and stuff like that that I I would go with because I like fruit juice. At our office, it is a coffee machine plus a water cooler confined to a tight space because we use the water cooler to put the water in the coffee machine. So putting them far away from each other would probably result in a disaster. Or at least a small war. Or hilarity. Yes. I thought it would be hilarious. My bosses said no, and I was overridden. So there we go. But on today's water cooler, we want to talk about something new and exciting in the Fedora community, which happen to be these new atomic desktops we keep hearing about, a new but yet old concept referring to the immutable distribution. Ah, but not immutable anymore. We're not talking immutable. That's the point. Okay. Yeah. So explain, Neil. Explain. All right. If you're going to point at me, then you better get your point across. I'm going to get the point across because I pointed at him. Here's the point. At and you. I'm pointing at him. Yeah. The Fedora Atomic desktops are essentially built on this technology called RPM OS tree. And what it does is wrap the traditional aspects of package management in a way where it creates this um, consistent, unified point of a transaction and writes it in such a way that each of them are single steps between each other. So atomic updates. And so the branding originally for these RPM OS tree things was atomic. And this goes all the way back to the project atomic days um, a decade ago. 
And that was all kind of shelved when Red Hat acquired CoreOS and integrated the CoreOS branding into the Fedora project and replaced Project Atomic with Fedora CoreOS, which left things in a very awkward position because uh, everything that was being built on top of what was back then the Fedora Atomic host uh, kind of was suddenly left without a name. And so we wound up having things like Fedora Silver Blue replace Fedora Atomic Workstation. And then we, as more um, variants uh, built on top of our PMOS tree as desktops became a thing. So we got Kinoite and then we got Saracia. Points for me for being able to say that right on the first try. <laughs> uh and um, and Onyx, uh, for some insane reason, people decided that our theme was minerals, which is not actually what was going on here. Um, but there's also Voxite, which never turned into a spin, but is actually a thing. And we're not going to go there. We're just we're just not. Uh, <laughs> before before we move on, just so, so everyone's clear, Kinoi is the KDE distribution. Right. Of, of Fedora top of the Fedora Atomic desktops. Yep. Uh, so Sia is the um, Sway. Sway. Yep. And then Onyx is uh, Budgie. Yes. Yep. So there are currently four desktops that are available. You've got Silver Blue, which is Fedora Atomic GNOME. You have Fedora Kinoite, which is Fedora Atomic KDE. And then you have uh what was fedora uh saracia which is now fedora atomic sway and sway then, atomic or sway is it sway oh yeah fedora sway atomic sorry it makes it sound funny the yeah way. I, I i think it's funny and fedora budgie atomic yeah <laughs> i would have preferred it to be fedora atomic but because then it'd be fab oh boy <laughs> but, that's you almost know what? bad as the uh the Fedora Budgie, which would have been Fudgy Project. So the Budgie Project? The Fudgy Project. The Fudgy. No, we are not. No, stop bringing up Fudgy. I want people to stop bringing that up. Please, no. I Fudgy don't is know a what thing that, that should. No, no, no. Fudgy is Fedora with Budgie. This is officially not allowed. Do not no, just no. I can't help it. It's it's just something that I've been ingrained with, and 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 I've had many conversations with the venerable you, Michael Tunnell about this. You've also talked to Josh Strobel, who says this every once in a while too. To I have Twitch to make me Twitch. Josh, if you're listening, hello. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Anyway, so we have all these desktop variants, and um. This actually stemmed from the challenge of Silverblue didn't want to share its name with other desktop variants. So everybody had to come up with their own for these um, RPM OS tree flavors, which also meant that it turned into a difficult conversation when you wanted to talk about what these things are. What is the what is the central halo name? How do you t refer to these as a as a group? And then Somebody got their head that this is about immutable desktops, which it's not. Immutable is not really. It is not really the driving force of these things. The driving force of these things is reliable, um, reliable upgrading, reliable updates, atomicity. If this thing fails, it fails safely. That's what it's all about. And so Fedora Atomic Desktop essentially makes that more crystal clear. And so Fedora Atomic Desktops is the umbrella organization, sub-organization within Fedora, which all of these desktops are part of. Um, while the different desktop variants that are atomic are managed by their special interest groups, for example, Fedora Kinoite remains Kinoite and is still managed by the KDE SIG. Fedora Silver Blue is still Silver Blue and is managed by the Workstation Working Group. Fedora Saracia becomes Fedora Sway Atomic and is still maintained by the Sway SIG. And Fedora Onyx 
becomes Fedora Budgie Atomic, managed by the Fedora Budgie SIG. And We're missing two. Hmm? We're missing two. We are missing XFCE. <clears throat> Please don't remind me about Voxite. Voxite doesn't exist yet. It So Voxite, which is the XFC flavor that doesn't exist and has never existed and still won't exist, um, was a definition that is being prototyped to have XFC run in this Fedora Atomic style. Um, at some point, it'll probably exist, but it won't be called Voxite because the naming is now dead. And so it's going to be called Fedora XFC Atomic if it ever becomes a thing. And then lastly, you are all forgetting about Cosmic Atomic or Atomic Cosmic because that just sounds cool. Do you think we will see a RPM OS tree like implementation of Cosmic as Cosmic becomes popular? Oh yeah, absolutely. The the there are people right now working on packaging the Cosmic desktop in Fedora. Like I think the special interest group just got set up today. Uh and uh people are looking at getting the components and the dependencies packaged up so that the Cosmic desktop can function in Fedora and I believe the intent is to have a regular spin as well as an atomic variant. So it's going to happen. Were these atomic spins part of the reason why we see the deprecation of X in some popular distributions and a full out push towards Wayland is so that these atomic desktops could be implemented a little bit better. Nah, it has no, it doesn't really have any bearing on X. I mean, when you think about it, right? Like Fedora core OS doesn't have a graphical environment. It's also the, an RPM OS tree flavor. Like all at the end of the day, the, the, the all X Wayland X and Wayland thing has, not very much to do with this because that's a dimension of systems architecture. That's not really a dimension of distribution delivery, right? So RPM OS tree is really about distribution delivery. One of the things that I found challenging with setting up any of these systems, and I've tried a few of them, is the balance of packages installed from RPM OS tree versus what am I installing as a flat pack? I tried it. My workflow didn't quite work with it. I punted and went back to my regular distribution. I think part of the challenge that I had was understanding how you actually kind of configure and install these things. I started reading about butane and ignition and combustion, and I thought I was back in engineering school. So I kind of gave up on that and realized that this was not meant for mortals such as myself. So what I think I'd like to see out of these is a better way of creating your, I'll call it a build environment for the deployment. Maybe that's just me and I'm nuts, or maybe other people have had similar situations. So one of the things I think is going to make this easier is using um, container files as a means of distribution. Because what's happened now is now it's a core OS based, the Fedora core OS based uh, ecosystem is now moving to an OCI image. So now I can build an image, build one of these images through a container file, which is great. It makes, it's going to, for me, it makes it easier to. Uh, just have a standard image because now it's a container file. Now it's literally, I could do this. Obviously, I could do this with Kickstart, you know, it's because Kickstart's just a file, but now it's the same process for a core OS system or one of these atomic spins. I think it's important to recognize that RPM OS trees underlying core tenant we don't really talk a lot the, about this but the underlying core tenant of rpm os tree is that it heavily favors server side composition of the artifact so the system that you're deploying the the optimized path is that you compose the final result you want to deploy server side and then deploy it at scale whether you use a container file to do it or you use core os assembler or you use OS build slash image builder to produce it using a blueprint. The idea is that you aren't doing anything on the computer itself. Um, 
all the workflows around doing things on the computer itself for adding and managing software are to some degree intentionally painful. And so the goal here is to not do that. Uh, while it is true, flat packs are kind of okay, right? You can just go through your software center and install the flat packs. They're not truly integrated into your desktop experience. They never can be. They're not designed to be. And as long as they remain not integrated into the desktop experience, they will have differences compared to what you're normally going to see when you use a regular distribution and install the packages either through RPMs or insert your traditional format here. That's not to say that there aren't advantages to this approach, right? You have different life cycles. You're able to operate on different cadences for the applications and the and the and the operating system. But you got to take that with, you know, with its trade-offs as well. At the end of the day, what you're probably looking towards if you're using some of these like atomic desktops in any meaningful scale is that you got to get familiar with the server-side composition tooling, which means you are pre-building your customizations on a layer on top of the OS tree and then shipping that. And whether you do that as the quote-unquote container-native way or you do it the quote-unquote RPM OS tree-native way, you pick a path and you do this. And that is going to be a tough pill to swallow for doing it for maybe one or two machines or doing it for yourself on an individual system. But if you're doing this for, say, kiosks or libraries or computer labs or or any of these other things, then it really scales out or even office workers, right? In a in those environments, it's much more reliable and scalable for being able to do that sort of thing. And that's where I think it shines, where you and I and maybe Brandon we don't fit the mold for a lot of these types of platforms. I'm sure we could all do it if we pushed at it hard enough, but it's really not made for the individual customizer thing. Uh, yeah, I see. I see the atomic desktops for fleets. I don't. I I could probably easily adapt it. I I have several systems in my house, like desktop systems, like for my wife my daughter etc uh, and like a just like some like a i have a like a couple tablets around the house uh for interacting with uh the the home assistant etc and i ha i manage that with a uh, foreman so i could easily <laughs> adapt my adapt it to it but does but does it make sense for me to do that? That that that's where I gotta make those decisions because it's uh, only a handful of systems. It's not a fleet. It, you know, it's about ten. But does it make sense? Probably, maybe, maybe not. If I'm managing it server side, what? Well, maybe, maybe it's fine. It also depends on what level of managing you're doing. Because like, if you're using Foreman to mostly manage the software update cadence, then it's not really worth it. But if you're doing things like also customizing the desktop experience, setting up the default shortcuts, or doing stuff along the lines of, you know, making it so you have, you know, basic account integrations and configuration and things like that in place, then sure, then it, it kind of makes sense to consider it. Um, I, I honestly think that mostly where I see this, these variants really being successful is for people that are low customized, low maintenance, uh, basic computing workloads, like what you typically see with Chromebooks where people just use a browser and maybe boot up one or two applications and don't really take advantage of integrations or customizations at the platform level. When you don't have to do those things, then this is a very freeing thing. And other than that, I I personally don't know if it makes a ton of sense. Like I also, I, I'm kind of of the opinion that these variants are more difficult for a lot of the developer use cases, um, unless you very much live fully in the container development model. Right, where you're using toolbox and you're doing everything by making containers and doing everything wrapped in that kind of model. If you're if you're doing that, then it's probably fine. 
if you're not doing that, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. And I guess it kind of depends for the kind of development I wind up doing it. It's I feel like I fight the system a little bit more, but I know of people where this is fantastic for them. So I guess it really depends. The only places where I've really seen the atomic desktop or even the atomic server is is in the enterprise these sort of distributions, the Red Hat E sort of in distributions, the Open Suzy SUSE side of things. Is this something that either of you feel like is going to become widely popular, where every distribution is going to have some sort of atomic spin to it, or does that just not fit because they're not our PMOS tree based? Is there some equivalent of this in the Debian space, or even? in some of the other spaces such as the the arch family or anything like that. Well, I don't know about Debian, but I do know that Ubuntu's got the Ubuntu snappy core stuff or the, now they call it the Ubuntu core. Uh, and that's all based on snaps and that's what they're they're doing on that front. And their paradigm is based on the idea of composing coarse dependency groups. So like instead of having each individual component be a dependency web that you can observe and manipulate you take groups of these things and turn them, these functional groups, into images that you install and connect to each other. So they're coarser. But they're still, in this sense, available. And those are able to be updated atomically, individually as components. The whole system moving atomically is not a thing, but you still have this atomic update mechanism that exists by being able to connect groups of snaps together and then refreshing them as the term goes, updating them in lockstep. Um, with the OpenSUSE world, they're taking a different tack by reusing the existing stack of package manager type stuff, and they're forcing every transaction to be redirected from the running system into an offline alternate target using ButterFS subvolumes and snapshots. And by doing this approach, you effectively are staging every traditional operation in an alternate location. And if it succeeds, you save it. And then you able you retarget the system to boot into it. If it fails, you throw it away and you go on with life. And that's another approach to doing atomic updates because you're introducing this non-granular success failure mode. In Arch, no, just just do whatever you want. You make up the thing that you want to use. You know, SteamOS is an Arch-based platform. They've introduced an AB-style image-based update. Um, there are many AB-style image-based update systems available for Debian as well. This is actually more common in the embedded space where you tend to see atomic updates done by literally flipping between disks that are disk formatted images and stuff like that. Um, so this is not a new concept. It's a very old concept. It just never had branding until very recently. I see this now a lot in the network space now that you kind of brought it up with the whole AB flip where, you know, for those of us that have worked on uh, Cisco equipment for years, the idea of copy run start, uh, and then being able to revert back if you needed to, if you saved things properly, or uh, in some of the other network appliances, you might have an uh, an older firmware image that you could boot from, and then your newest firmware image you could boot from and go back and forth if you if you had a problem. So I guess that that makes a lot of sense now. Uh, in my workflow, it's, it just didn't fit. I have I have too many weird use cases between virtual machines and gaming and this and that where. I had to use our PMOS tree or when I was running it with OpenSUSE, micro transaction install. And then I was rebooting basically every five minutes to the point where I no longer wanted to use my computer ever again. And so I just went back to the, the normal happy land where I was from. Is, is updating with atomic updates faster? Is it slower? Are there... Is doing a distribution upgrade different when you when you work in that space? Distribution upgrade definitely easier, and so going from Fedora thirty nine to forty, easy peasy, no no big deal. It's uh, 
but in terms of speed, I don't know if it's necessarily faster. Um, I, I would probably argue that they're slower now because you now are taking the same speed you have to do for a distribution upgrade and you're applying it to everything. All upgrades are effectively distribution upgrades. That's why it's a rebase. You're you're rebasing to a new RPM OS tree commit as their verbiage goes. And as you keep doing that, you're you're essentially and as we switch to this container native OS tree thing, we also now have to download more all the time because everything's now wrapped in these OCI images rather than being the the content data store model that RPM OS tree natively does. And so you're going to see it take longer. And this is actually why they emphasize doing everything in the background and doing it automatically and staging it so that you don't observe that. Like I have a laptop running Fedora Kinoid. You know how long it takes for it to do an update? About 35 minutes every time. And the reason is it has to download everything, then has to stage it. And then I have to reboot into it. The actual applying the update, super quick. Everything else, super slow. But in an ideal world, that's all happening in the background and you don't notice. Well, the goal is to kind of make it feel more like a upgrade, like an iPhone or Android. And it's very, it's pretty much that. That's the goal of the experience. I think that that's fine for certain use cases. Does it make sense for every, every, uh, every device out there? I don't know. Maybe. But well, speaking of new and cutting edge technologies out there or changes new and cutting edge changes to the Linux ecosystem, from what I hear, there's some interesting news regarding new Nouveau and NVIDIA. That's a lot of ends and news for a news topic. See, I had a, I, I managed to throw the pun in there. You're all welcome. Now, the worst my, part is that the pun was my idea. It was your idea, and I just happened to take it. I'm not going to apologize. Sorry, not sorry. All I know in my experience in using NVIDIA with Linux is that it's wanted to make me rip my hair out every time that I have updated my system because of the way that the NVIDIA proprietary drivers have been implemented up to and including me purchasing a new rig about a year and a half ago that was all AMD based so I wouldn't have this problem. Oh, the thing is though is right now the amount of time I have wasted on figuring out issues with AMD graphics and Open G OpenCL issues except since October. So it's February as of this recording, it's February. And I am still having issues with ROCM, the general kernel driver, and all the mess of stuff with AMD. It made me wish I bought an NVIDIA graphics card instead. <laughs> and here I am in the middle, regretting my choices with both of these stacks. There's always the third choice, which is the Intel Arc series. Oh my gosh, Brandon, that face makes me think that you you had a bad experience there too. It it it's fine. <laughs> Let's oh just go boy. with it's fine. You don't want to if you don't want to run anything, it's great. <laughs> well, I like video cards because they make things look nice or they just look nice in the machine. I don't care how they perform. No, I'm just kidding. No. You don't, I think you very much care how they perform, considering they're the uh, biggest sucking energy monsters on in the system. We had a prior conversation uh, before recording, Neil and I, about uh, GPUs and, and, and building machines because unfortunately two of my servers uh, decided to retire in my home lab. Uh, both were about 10 years old and it was probably time for them to check out anyway. Uh, so we were just briefly talking about the hardware, but I'm kind of curious more about the new Nouveau stuff. Like what's, what's going on with this? I'll throw in a little brief and then let's have Brandon like dig into it more because I know this is actually going to be fun for him, his side of the fence because of how much NVIDIA his life is going to be full of. Um, so for some backstory here, if we walk back about two years, uh, Red Hat uh, NVIDIA announced at separately, but around the time that Red Hat Summit happened, 
that they were opening up their kernel module component, their kernel, their driver architecture, and providing an open source driver for the NVIDIA cards. The goal around this was to support data center and graphics workloads. And this involved re-architecting uh, the driver setup so that more of the way that the communication, handling, management things related to the GPU are pushed down to firmware. And so the driver is just really instrumenting firmware commands to do things. This is referred to as the GSP platform firmware. Um, I actually don't remember offhand what GSP stands for. Uh, it is an initialism that I do not remember. The important part is that this firmware is part of the NVIDIA hardware platform that is used for NVIDIA hardware, starting with um, Turing GPUs released in 2018. So that's the RTX 20 series, G or RTX 2000 or 20 series or whatever someone wants to call this. And then, of course, the following year, the GTX 16 series or 1600 series or whatever you want to call this, right? These two GPUs are Turing. And then the next generation was in 2020 with uh, the Ampere series, RTX 30 series or 3000 series or whatever. And then currently, I think it was last year that they were launched, is the Ada Lovelace. RTX 40 series, RTX 4000 series, whatever, again, whatever you want to call this. These GPUs basically comprise of the last five to six years of AMD GPU architectures that they've released and sold, and today cover the whole gamut of GPUs that NVIDIA sells today from the low end to the high end. These GPUs are covered by this GSP firmware, and over the course of the last couple of years, the open source code that NVIDIA released for their drivers has been used as a way to understand how to integrate this into Nouveau, which is the traditional NVIDIA open source driver that is included in the Linux kernel and is used for driving the GPUs when you're not using the proprietary driver. Now, famously, Nouveau has been considered um, not the greatest of drivers um, to put a to, to put it in. Um, but with this change to using the firmware, Nouveau starts moving to being more similar to AMD GPU, where AMD GPU is largely a thin driver that talks to, that sends commands down to the hardware through firmware commands. Um, AMD GPU is a huge pile of firmware with a thin driver on top, and that's how the cards work. And now Nouveau is moving to the same model. And as is the NVIDIA proprietary driver, right? These, this is a shared architecture. We're reusing the same firmware that the proprietary driver uses. The goal is, as we build this up and support this and do this, over the, we will reach similar performance levels to the proprietary driver and to the AMD driver and so on. Now, that's just the kernel component. It's also important to talk about that all Linux graphics drivers are actually two pieces. Uh, it is a user space kernel component and a kernel component. The kernel component is Nouveau. The user space component is Mesa. Now in Mesa, there was some development around a brand new Vulkan compiler called NAK. And that is built on top of, uh, that is the underpinning of the Nouveau, the new Nouveau Vulkan driver NVK, which is part of Mesa. That's the user space component. You pair this new Nouveau with the new Vulkan, and you now have a fully, you have an open source driver stack that functions reasonably performantly. I believe there was um, a tweet by uh, Pierre Luc, uh, Pierre Luc Cafais. Sorry, I butchered the French name. I have to actually hear it once or twice before I'll get it right, because French is full of letters that don't have intuitive sounds. But he did a test run of experimental code from this way back in December. And he was able to play the hat in time game at around or exceeding the performance levels of running it on the NVIDIA proprietary driver. Now, this is a very optimal path because it's DirectX to Vulkan to, to the host. So it's DXVK to Vulkan to NVK down to the hardware. 
We don't know what that looks like, what the performance differentials look like with OpenGL and things like that. We'll see how that goes. But it is very promising that we are going to be on an architecture in which we have a, a new level of potential reliability because we're now interacting with with the driver in a, with the hardware in a similar way to the proprietary driver. So what you're saying basically is that with this new relationship between like Vulcan and NVIDIA, we're all going to live long and prosper. That's not what I said. I said things will be ba- better. Vulcan, Star Trek. Oh, yes, I know. But I'm I'm intentionally just breaking this. No, no, you don't break that. That was great. Star Trek references always win. All yeah, right. but not when it's NVIDIA. <laughs> I haven't really dove into this too heavily, but the big question I have, because the thing that I care about isn't actually graphics. It's CUDA apps <laughs> and things like that. Like I want access to the I want to be able to do AI workloads off of this. Like this will make things uh, for in at least uh, for me personally, if, if I do anything in my uh, home lab, uh, it would be, you know, self-hosting an AI model. And I'd want, I, mean, I, I know you can with it already trained or whatever, and I just have to do a little bit of inferencing. You can do that with a CPU. It's not that big of a deal. But if I actually want to make it work well and not be slow, you want um, CUDA or at the very least something that can do open CL. Uh, so in that case, it'd be AMD. Uh, would be doing it over uh, OpenCL with um, ROCM. So what what does that look like? I suspect what we're going to see, again, I don't know, because Mm -hmm. uh, like the extent that I know about this is, can I have the graphics card not freeze up the computer all the time? that's, That's a good starting point to like get from. I think what we're going to see in the future is we're going to see more movement towards Rustical, which... uh, I should explain. Rustical, Rust ICL, is an implementation of OpenCL in Mesa that is um, in t- designed to be hardware agnostic, written in Rust. And it's ru- written by um, a person named Carol Herbst over at Red Hat, who's been doing it originally as a spare time project. And now it's, I think, one of the things that, that Red Hat's pushing more into. The idea around this is to give a OpenCL implementation that's performant and can be easily scaled to multiple GPUs uh, very easily. And I I expect Rustical en- enablement for for NVIDIA hardware to be on on the roadmap for that. Yeah. Again, I've, no confirmations. I have no idea what the heck's going on, but that's where I expect things to go. Yeah, and that on my AMD based ThinkPad and on my AMD based on my AMD GPU that I mentioned earlier, that does work well Mm -hmm. for, uh, well, it just started working well. I should say it's brand new. Oh, thank you to, uh, uh, commits that hit, um, the mainline kernel, uh, back in mid January that finally hit kernel six, seven and, uh, six, six. So, (laughs) uh, yeah. And Fedora 40, we're going to have all that enablement turned on. And yeah, and I th- right now I know a lot of the so yeah, so this is really good news. Like in terms of the uh, having an open source driver that just more or less works. Well, I, maybe I'll I'll uh, I do have a uh, a tur I do have a Turing card somewhere. Maybe I'll give it a shot and see if it, how well it works. See if it, see if I do not need the proprietary driver to run a CUDA workload. I do not think you will be able to run a CUDA workload mm-hmm. without the NVIDIA proprietary driver because the CUDA interfaces are not part of Nouveau. Ah. But, but 
I should also point out that a little known piece of the NVIDIA open drivers is that they do include a dedicated kernel module for being able to do CUDA. So the the graphics and the compute parts of the NVIDIA driver are actually split into separate kernel modules. So you could build and install only the CUDA component and use the open driver for everything else. Okay. And you could use Nouveau for everything else. That makes sense. Okay. So that might be worth you trying and let, let us all know how it works out. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Thank, thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. While we are on the topic of graphics, there's certainly some big news coming out very, very soon, which is something I'm very excited about personally, and that is the release of KDE Plasma 6. A big shout out to the everybody who's worked on the KDE Plasma release to get six to where it is. I got to see a sneak peek of it today. It's my first time looking at it. And I'm just beyond excited to actually get it going on one of my systems to see where it can go. Uh, from what I understand, there are just countless improvements over where we are currently with Plasma 5.27, which is pretty ubiquitous across most distributions still. Neil, I know that you are a big player in the uh, KDE Plasma space, so I'm uh, I'm going to let you kind of tell us some of the things we can look forward to maybe in Plasma 6. Well, uh, I think it's more important to say what you should not expect in Plasma 6, and that is you should not expect Plasma 6 to be all that different from Plasma 5. That's a, I think that's actually the biggest feature right this is a this is for the first time that i can remember where kd plasma or kde does a major version bump and it's not a complete change of the architecture to go with it in in many respects if you look at a plasma 5 and a plasma 6 system a plasma 6 environment looks just like plasma 5 with maybe some settings changed some defaults changed and that's really it. It's really a refinement release. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. KDE Plasma has built an experience. KDE has built a, an experience with KDE Plasma that I think people are really pleased with. And continuing what works and refining it and building upon that is, is a good thing to do. Because why fix what ain't broke? So in other words, your idea of porting Plasma over to GTK did not go. How dare you? How dare you would insinu mm, in insinuate uh, I would even contemplate such a ludicrous suggestion. So I'm remembering KDE3. Again, met, I didn't say Plasma. It wasn't Plasma then. To KDE4. I think they introduced KDE Plasma, the name there, and that, and nothing's going to break. Is that what I'm hearing? It's not going to be like that when I uh, upgraded, uh, I think it was OpenSUSE 10 to 11, and my, and my whole world was destroyed. It hasn't been for me. I have like three or four computers where I've done this upgrade already, and it's been fine. Don't even start with the whole, it works on my computer, or, therefore the bug doesn't exist. Uh, okay, no, I will, I will, I'll make the point that it is intended to not be a radical shift where everything breaks. There's been a lot of attention paid to handling the migrations, doing settings changeovers, handling all that stuff. Like, there's even been a strong effort to make sure 6.0 is actually a stable release. Like there was a whole cockamamie thing around the KDE 4 era when it was first starting out where 4.0 wasn't by some people considered safe for human consumption, which is flat out ridiculous. You don't release a, 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 a GA release that is not fit for human consumption. That's a horrible idea. And we are doing everything within the, in, in this space to avoid that this go I, around. And I think we've done a really good job here. I, I was exaggerating a little bit on my on that transition from three to four. Uh, 
but I do remember a few things breaking, but it really wasn't that big of a deal. But probably the biggest change for uh, for that community was four to five. Because uh, that, uh, that took a hammer to the architecture again, right? Like everything got broken up into distinct life cycles, distinct components. Um, and that was, it was a big change. And it, for, in my opinion, it was a good change. Oh, I mean, granted, there was a lot of growing pains along the way, like having the di- breaking it all up so that the frameworks had it, its very own life cycle. Really good idea. And finally, I, I, you know, we're finally seeing that sort of happening on uh, the GTK side, you know, with GNOME. So you have the GNOME stuff and it, which independent of GTK. And so GTK has its own life cycle and GNOME is no longer tied to GTK, which is great in my opinion. So, uh, well, it's I still would like tied to, be, to it. I, I mean, would it's like still for, tied to it, but it's not tied to its life cycle. Right. I would like to see GTK further decoupled from GNOME. I don't think it will ever happen, but I would actually really like that because GTK is much broadly, much more broadly used than beyond GNOME. Oh yeah. No, I just, uh, it, it's just mostly the, uh, I was mostly saying the light, I was more refer, you know, doing the comparison on the life cycle. It was like Gnome's life cycle is heavily coupled to GTK, whether that was intentional or not, it, it's still, it was very, uh, seemed to be coupled together. Like GTK three was very well aligned to, uh, Gnome three and same with GTK four and Gnome 40. But really, that's where they wanted to make that split, uh, that split, so that it didn't see. So, because like if when GNOME fifty comes out, it could still very well be GTK four base and not GTK five. Well, and, I think it's going to be that way because that's yeah. not GNOME fifty is not that far away. Nope, no, it's not. So, you mean it won't be cute based. Oh, you all oh, wish, man. but it won't. Yeah, that would uh, be nice. I I don't care either way. It's just a. It's either way. It's just a framework. Uh. <laughs> but really, I think it, it, it's important to under. You know, it's important to underscore exactly how much of not a big deal for users the move from five to six is going to be. The big changes around this are a bunch of defaults are changing, and. We're getting a new wallpaper, which we get a new wallpaper with every plasma release. So that's not a big deal either. Um, and the move to Qt 6, which will improve the efficiency of the desktop. It'll reduce memory usage, resource usage, and it has improved Wayland support. And the important part about that is KD Plasma 6 is Wayland by default. That's awesome. So I think that's great. I mean, that that's been... I've been wanting that for a while. I, I've been using Wayland on either KDE or GNOME for years. Uh, it's probably... I've been daily oh. driving Plasma Wayland since 2019, I want to say. And it's it's leaps and bounds in improvements. I would today argue, if you look at KDE Plasma 6, it is the most featured Wayland environment out there. It beats GNOME, in my opinion, on features and capabilities, and it beats pretty much everything else I've ever seen. I think the only one that kind of will come close is going to be Cosmic, because Cosmic is Wayland only, and they put a lot of effort and energy towards reaching that comparable feature set that people expect from a high-end desktop experience leveraging Wayland protocols, portals, pipe wire, all these things. Well, when I know I know it's landing in GNOME 46, uh, headless RDP. If that happens in KDE, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you'll get me to switch. I will but, get you to switch before that. But no, you won't. <laughs> yes, I will. I will get you. You will. I will make you because KD Plasma Six has tons of compelling features from a user experience perspective, 
if you're on Wayland. You have HDR support. You have variable refresh rate support. You have remote desktop protocol support. You have um, all these other but things. But it's not headless, Neil. It's not headless. <laughs> you w- look, 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 man. <laughs> You can do headless VNC, I think. I don't think you want to run that, but you could. That doesn't count. I, I said headless RDP. Yes. That, that, that is very, very important. I do not want VNC. VNC needs to die in a fire. Yeah. I think and you should meet in the middle and have headless VNC over headless RDP tunneled through it. Bill, you can go die in a fire for that comment. Neil, he don't no, he doesn't need to. He just like he's trolling you mostly. Yes, he mm-hmm. is, I know. So he gets bonus points for that. So <laughs> I I will gladly take my bonus points and run for the hills. Anyway, for headless RDP, there is some work going on around supporting RDP within KD Plasma. There's a KRDP library that implements an RDP mm-hmm. server plugged into Plasma yeah. through the through its Wayland protocols and stuff like that. There's some further work to add interfaces for this, but honestly, I don't expect headless RDP to be a full blown thing until we have an integrated login manager. So one of the things that's going to come further down the line for KD Plasma is that SDDM is going to be forked into KDE as a project and going to be integrated with the rest of the stack in a similar way that GNOME does with GDM because uh, that will allow some of these gaps that we have to be closed where we can do these kinds of things. And like some dumb stuff that we have that would be that are, that is fixable by having this integrated thing is the handoff between the 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 login manager compositor and the desktop compositor, even when they're both Quinn, they can't hand off to each other properly. So you see for a brief moment, it shuts down. You see the frame buffer again from UEFI, for example, and then the desktop shows back up, right? And those kinds of things are all endemic of this lack of integration between the different levels of the stack. Yeah, it's been that way with... (sighs) Well, I can't re- remember at when S when SDDM was introduced. Yeah, that's all the way back with Plasma yeah, Drive. Yeah, so it's when been KDM some time. was killed. That was, yeah. I mean, to be fair, right? We're talking about KDM was a monstrosity that was also X11 only. Like yeah. there was basically no path to getting to a Wayland environment. SDDM actually has a unique property that I haven't found in any other um, login manager. Is that you can actually tell it to run under arbitrary Wayland compositors, hmm. which has made it a, a favorite of sorts for a lot of unaffiliated random desktops to use it as a login manager, because you can just tell it to use whatever Wayland compositor you want. Interesting. I didn't so, know that. for example, by default, SDDM will run Wayland on, will run the Wayland compos- the Wayland greeter under Weston. But for Fedora KDE, we've been running it under Quinn, which is the KDE Wayland compositor. Mm-hmm. And um, the Fedora Sway uh, uses SDDM and they run it under the Sway compositor. And so like they're able uh, other desktops that are like, OK, we want to have this working. Um, we want to have an end to end Wayland login to desktop experience. SDDM is sufficiently pluggable that they're able to do that without a lot of pain and effort. And that's good. But for KDE Plasma to reach that next level of feature integration and quality, like there's there are things that we have to do that we can't do if we want SDDM to remain usable by other desktops at this at, at like a baseline level of integration. Um, and so we'll see Plasma Login Manager come into existence at some point. Right. And and that will that'll allow us to do things like deduplicate our screen locker and our login code because they do the same bloody thing, do the same bloody like greeter logic, but in two different places. Stuff <laughs> like that is, you know, GNOME yeah. doesn't have this problem because it's GDM, GDM runs GNOME shell as its greeter with a plugin that makes it look different. And then when you log in to GNOME through GDM, what happens is that the greeter hands over 
to GNOME shell that's running in the desktop and, and it passes over smoothly and everything just carries over. This is one of the reasons why you still have this. You have the same top bar stuff. You can have all the same settings carry over from from the greeter down into the from the login manager to the desktop. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. And I will try Plasma 6 when Fedora 40 drops. Whether if it stays on my system is another story. <laughs> I will get you to switch. I think the question is, how long does it stay? Are we talking an hour, a day, maybe a week? The last minutes? time I installed K- uh, Kitty Plasma on on this, on I haven't installed. It's never been on my workstation, uh, my big workstation. It will never be on my big workstation until I, unless I make a big switch. But I have installed it on my main laptop, and it was on my main laptop for all of 30 minutes. That I'll tell you why. Oh. I'll tell you why. I like, uh, well, one of the things that, I like about GNOME is evolution. I I know people hate evolution in parts of the GNOME community, but I love evolution. Evolution is my preferred email client, and the evolution data server is extremely integrated into GNOME. And I have my calendar and everything inside of native things that makes it easier my workflow is just easier the pim suite in kde makes me want to punch things i can't say i disagree with you (laughs) i i like to get work done and yeah. I need, I, yeah, oh, I, like everyone's solution is, oh, use Thunderbird. Have you, uh, Thunderbird, uh, for calendar integration with uh, Google Workspaces is 1000% broke. It will either duplicate appointments or resend out appointments that I have canceled. So, oh, no, no, you've done it to us. No, I'm not using, yeah, uh, I know because you've done this to us when we've done scheduling for this yeah, for these recordings. Because I've tried, yeah. Because uh, you guys were my guinea pigs when Thunderbird Supernova, uh, or whatever at one fifteen came out. Uh, I tried it with my pseudo show email, which is on Work Google Workspace, and yes, uh, it's all kinds of broke. There are two offline calendars, no, PIM suites that work perfectly with uh, Google Workspaces, Evolution, and Apple. That is it. Thunderbird will do IMAP just fine, obviously. Like it does the mail side just fine. But you want calendar functionality? Forget it. Uh, contact uh, or K mail and K organizer. Uh, totally broke. Uh, uh, actually, KML works just fine. I, I, I will say it does work just fine. But K Organizer for it, it actually does the same, has the same problem as um, as Thunderbird. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because of the uh, CalDAV implement. The CalDAV, uh, it's like all CalDAV is for. Um, Google is a front end to their API. I don't know if it's a problem with that or what. I don't it's know. It's a problem with the CalDev front end. Um, but so I can at least it's say been, this. Mo- but it's been so broke for years, mm-hmm. even be- uh, on Thunderbird, especially even before it, uh, the CalDev thing was a front to the API when it was just regular CalDev. It was just broke. So I don't know if it was Google's implementation of CalDAV or if Thunderbird is just broke. I can tell you it's actually Google's, and here's why. Because if if I do not install the Google Workspace for Outlook add-on on Windows machines, it doesn't work at all. 
if I install the Google Workspace add-on for Outlook in Windows, it sort of works. And I have constant issues where calendar appointments either don't send or they send duplicates or they just don't show up. And as a result, the conversations that I have with, with my clients are, are you married to Outlook? If so, Office 365 is the way to go for you. If you are not married to Outlook and you prefer to use the Google suite of, of applications, do it through the web, please. So ironically, where I've had the fewest calendar issues. Here we go. It's Here we go. So Saw it coming. Zimbra always had calendar issues. Google, I have calendar issues where I've had zero calendar issues. Zero, none, zilch, 365. They don't know how to do mail, but dang, they know how to do calendar. <laughs> and Brandon is bringing this up to needle at both of us because what he's not telling you is that for about a year, we were all forced to suffer Microsoft 365 for the pseudo show. Uh, it's work, cheaper too. Stuff. Don't even get me started. And he made me suffer through Teams meetings. I did that. It was just very for you. amusing. Yeah, it was I know. You did that. Extremely amusing. To really screw with Brandon. Me. Implemented it. Neil suffered. I laughed maniacally. That's how. Well, that you all already went. have to deal with it for your day to day, so it, it can't add any more strain. No, I can't be in any more more mental or emotional <laughs> pain than than I already am having to do it every day. But it was interesting to see how that was applying a, uh, we'll call it a square peg with a round hole. But yeah, um, I can at least say that there has been a renewed effort around the KDE PIM stuff. When I was at Fostum, and we'll we'll talk about Fostum at another point in time. Um, when I was at Fostum, I talked to some of the developers who work on Akonadi and the KDE PIM stack. And there is a very strongly renewed effort uh, and, and much more investment going into revitalizing and improving this and making the defaults better and having it work better with things like Google and Microsoft and all these other things. So I think, I don't know how much of this has landed now for 6.0, because again, KD, KD PIM operates on its own life cycle. So you can, it, it updates at its own pace. Um, but it is probably worth regularly taking a poke at the stack. Now, for what it's worth, I do have Akinati connected to all of my Google accounts so that I... Um, get calendar invites on my desktop. I get all the calendar notifications for all of my Google accounts on my computer because if I didn't, I would miss everything. And that part works phenomenally well. Mercuro, which is the successor to calendar and K and going to eventually succeed K Organizer, um, and maybe will be a K Mail front end at some point. Right now, it just mostly does calendar and groupware type things. Oh, it does a, a good job of showing that stuff and letting you manipulate it. So, uh, my memory, if my memory is right, there is Mercuro Calendar, which was calendar. It's the same code. Uh, Mercuro Contacts, or yep. I, I think it's address book. But there is Mercuro Mail. Yes, and I right now it's it. only re right now it's read only. They are working on adding the it, right stuff eventually. So, the idea is that eventually Mercuro will basically be the evolution of the KDE side. So that is exciting. And if they fix the calendar, the, the calendar issues with the uh, Google workspace, uh, I will be happy. I'd be happy. Give it a to shot and file bug reports because like a big part of the problem oh, with this stuff is, my. is people, people don't use it and tell them like what's going on so that they can like pinpoint it and fix it. There is an open, but I know there is an open bug for the exact problem I have that is seven years old, not in con not for calendar, but it's in, uh, the, uh, the back end, the Akinati server in Akinati. Okay. Well, Throw a comment, say it still affects it on the very latest version, and and we'll see how that goes. But yeah. there is a renewed interest in the KDE PIM stack, and I think we're going to see... I don't know if we'll see the improvements right away, but we're going to see the improvements coming down the line. And I'm actually looking forward to that because I now have too many accounts to just do everything web-based. I need, I need integrated desktop stuff. And all of my choices currently suck, and I really would like it to not be that way. 
Well, boys, it's time to go back to work. The uh, boss keeps walking by us and giving us weird looks. That means we should probably go back to our proverbial desks and attempt to get some work done. So thanks for joining me at the water cooler. I hope to see you both again soon. And to everybody else out there, as always, thank you for watching or listening to The Sudo Show, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network, and we will see you again next time.